If you made it past chapter 4 on market structures, then congratulations. We will be starting on a new chapter today, and it's a chapter on market for factors. And factors here actually refers to factors of production. Now, this is going to be a relatively short video because um, I believe the concepts can be delivered in a very straightforward manner. Okay, so I'm going to start with a very simple model to explain how the market for factor works. Okay, so we're going to assume that um, firms are perfectly competitive, all right, uh, and they are non monopsonous. And what this means is that um, they are not the only hirer in the labor market. Okay. So we're actually talking about labor down here, okay? Uh, labor is going to be our focus for this video. And also, there's going to be some short run and long run analysis. And just to remind you, in the short run, the capital of the firm is fixed. And in the long run, the capital can be more flexible, okay? So our job over here is to actually um, analyze how do firms demand for factors, okay? That will be the focus of this video. How do firms demand for labor? Okay, we've seen how consumers demand for goods. Now we need to see how the firms demand for labor. Okay, so we're going to begin with the profit maximization problem. And the profit function is given as the price multiplied by the quantity minus um, the cost of labor and the cost of capital. So P over here is price and it is said to be exogenous, which means is that it is determined by external factors. Why? because this is a perfectly competitive market, right? So the firms have got no control over the price whatsoever. Okay, so that's P. Now, Q over here, uh, actually Q bracket L comma K, refers to the production function. And over here, um, in order to build anything, to build any goods, you're going to need labor and capital, right? And that is why uh, the production function here is a function of labor and capital at the same time. So W over here refers to the nominal wage. Okay, when I say nominal, I'm talking about in dollar form. L here refers to the amount of labor. R is the interest rate, and K obviously refers to capital. All right. So now that we have explained the profit function, let's look at a short run. In the short run, capital is fixed. Therefore, the firm would have to maximize its profit with respect to labor, only labor. You can only choose the amount of labor in the short run, right? You can't choose how much capital it wants to have. So I'm going to differentiate this function with respect to labor, and we're going to get the price multiplied by the marginal product of labor minus the nominal wage equals to zero. So MPL here refers to the marginal product from labor, and it refers to the additional um, goods okay, or products uh, from adding an additional unit of labor into your production. Okay, so um, I can actually summarize this into the marginal product from labor is equals to the nominal wage divided by price. And the nominal wage divided by the price actually gives me uh, this thing called the real wage. Okay, so what the real wage means to the worker is that this is its purchasing power. We've talked about this in chapter 2. So the firm it actually refers to the quantity of goods that one worker is worth. So what does that mean? If you're going to pay me $1,000 to produce a soap bars that cost $2 to sell, uh, that, that, that people sell for $2, uh, what that means is that I'm actually worth 500 bars of soap. So that is what I'm worth to you, right? If you hire me for $1,000, that's it. And you're running a soap company. Okay, so now the question is, is there a curve for marginal product of labor? Well, yes, well, there's almost a curve for everything. As long as in maths, you can have a curve for anything. Just that some curves don't look very nice, but um, this one is pretty okay. So just like marginal cost, you derive it from your total cost, right? So to derive a marginal product, you need to look at the total product curve. So on the horizontal axis, you got the amount of labor, and on the vertical axis, you got the total product. As you can see, this is actually the inverse of the total cost function, right? Is the inverse, okay, means it's, it, it, it's curving at opposite places. All right, so on the left side of the middle, this is where you have increasing returns to scale, and where it starts to flatten out, that's actually your decreasing returns to scale. So how are we going to derive our marginal product uh, of labor? Well, I think you should be pretty good at this already. So we know that 
to derive anything marginal, you basically take the tangents of the graph and then you're going to measure the gradient of it, right? So you'll notice that it's going to be a curve that looks like this. All right, so that's the marginal product of labor. And there you have it. This is your real wage, the level of real wage. And you have two points where there is profit maximization. So at point A, where you hire L0 amount of labor, or at point B, where you hire L1 amount of labor. So if I'm at point A and I hire L0 amount of labor, what is the cost to the company? Well, it's this red box over here. Well, basically, it's the amount of labor multiplied by the real wage, right? So that's the cost. And this blue shaded region over here is basically the benefits, the amount of product that is being produced. So the red box is bigger than the blue box, which means that the cost is more than the benefit. Well, that sucks, right? So I don't really want to be at point A. So let's take a look at point B, shall we? So at point B, the cost of labor to the company is actually this red box that you see over here. And the benefit is this blue region that you see over here. So obviously there is a surplus of benefit over here over the cost. Right? So what this means is that the benefit is actually more than the cost if I were to hire at L1. Therefore, what I can conclude is that the firm will always be demanding for labor on the downward sloping portion of the marginal product for labor curve. So this is the demand curve uh, of labor for the short run. Okay, it's only in the short run. Okay? So this black portion that you see over here is the demand curve uh, for labor of the firm in the short run. Okay, so now that we have settled the short run, what does the demand curve for labor look like in the long run? So in order to understand this fully, you're going to need the isocos and the isocon as well. Well, I know some of you might be mumbling, ah oh, man, the isocos and the isocon again, you know, these are two really annoying curves. But uh, don't worry, I'll just run you through it and guarantee you that it's going to be pretty easy to understand if quick economics were to explain it. Okay, so this is the demand curve in the short run for labor. And let's just say that the, the real wage is at W0, okay, and the firms are hiring L0. Let's assume that the nominal wage falls, okay, that brings the real wage to W1, and we're going to move on to point B, okay, where the firm is hiring more labor at L1. But that makes sense, right? If labor is cheaper, you hire more. So uh, in the short run, capital is fixed at K0. And that's why you've got this um, short run expansion path over here. And let's just say that the long run expansion path is here. Okay. And assuming that this is the ISO cost. And I'm going to draw my ISO quant that looks like this. And the firm is producing X not amount of X. So we're at point A. So you see, this is the same point A, right? So let's say that the nominal wage falls. Okay, what this means is that the wage to interest rate ratio is going to fall, which gives me a flatter ISO cost, which looks like this, okay? So if I don't want to change my level of production, I will have to be at that point over there that, that I just drew. Okay, so what's going to happen is that when the nominal wage falls, I'm going to increase my production. Why? Look, when the marginal cost is going to decrease, right, it's going to shift to the right due to the fall in wages, therefore I'm going to be producing more given the price of P, right? So I will be at point B over here in the short run, Let's compare the amount of labor that is being hired. So initially, at point A, I'll be hiring L0 amount of labor. Okay, so it's the same there. And at point B, I'll be hiring L1. See, it's the same. So this is the short run analysis. So now we're going to talk about the long run because there is a change in the wage uh, to interest rate ratio. There's also going to be a new long run expansion path that looks like this. So the long run expansion path is where all the tangents between the ISO cost and the ISO quant is going to happen. So let's shift the ISO cost upwards and have the intersection over there. Okay, so this is my new level of production. And you know why it's here? Because the firm in the long run will actually increase its amount of capital from K0 to K1. Okay, and the reason for this is because since labor is more expensive, is less expensive right now, what we can do is to get more capital so that the more labor that I hire have actually more machines to work on, right? So when the capital increases, the marginal product of labor is going to increase as well. Why? Because more machines means more work done. So the marginal product of labor curve is going to shift to the right, which is also the demand for labor in the short run. So in the long run, I'll be at point C hiring L2 amount of labor. 
So to find the long run demand for labor, you just connect point A and point C and then you have the demand curve for labor in the long run. And the demand for labor is seen to be more elastic in the long run than in the short run, right? Because the demand curve for labor is flatter than the demand curve for labor in the short run. Okay, so, so I'm going to use um, another case to prove that that is always a scenario, right? Uh, the, the demand for labor in the long run will always be more elastic. Okay, this time instead of the wage rate uh, decreasing, I'm going to assume that the wage rate is going to increase. Okay, so I'm going to draw uh, my isocost and isocon properly again. Okay, so that's my short run expansion path and my long run expansion path. Okay, so that's my isocost. All right, so initially at point A, and we are hiring L0 amount of labor. Capital is fixed at K0. So this is my demand curve for labor. And when the real wage is at W0, I'll be hiring L0 amount of labor. See, it's the, the amount of labor is same for both graphs. So when the nominal wage is going to increase, what this means that the real wage is going to increase as well, right? Because the nominal wage is the numerator. So the real wage increases to W1. And in the short run, this brings me to point B, where the firm actually reduces the amount of labor that they hire to L1. So the wage to interest rate ratio is going to increase. Therefore, I'm going to have a steeper ISO cost that you see over here. Okay, so uh, that's my new ISO cost because of the new uh, cost ratios. So what's going to happen next? Well, I'm going to decrease my production. Why? Because my cost is now higher, right? At higher cost, my cost curves are going to shift up and when the price is the same, I'm basically making lesser because P equals MC is now at a lower quantity. So in the short run, I'm over at point B where I'm hiring L1. See, same on the right side graph, right? So now we're going to proceed into the long run and you're going to notice a few things that's going to happen. So the first thing that's going to happen is that the firm is going to reduce its amount of capital. Why is that the case? Because when labor is more expensive, you cut down your labor, right? And when you cut down your labor, you basically are going to need lesser machines for them to operate. So the long run expansion path is also going to change. It's going to become steeper like you see over there. So the short run expansion path shifts down because capital is now lesser. And there I have it. I have my new cost minimizing point at L2, right? I'm hiring lesser uh, and therefore when capital falls, the marginal product of labor falls. Uh, and this is because when there are lesser machines, so there's lesser work done. So the MPL shifts to the left, which also means that the demand curve in the short run shifts to the left. So I should be at point C in the long run, hiring only L2 amount of labor. So again, I connect points A and C, I get the demand curve for the long run. And there you see again that the demand curve for labor is actually more elastic in the long run than in the short run. Okay, so it's always the same case. So hopefully this is a good enough explanation. Uh, because I think uh, what you see in the subject guide is a little bit more confusing. So I hope that Quick Economics has been of much help. With that, I want to thank you for studying with Quick Economics. We'll see you in the next video when we talk about the supply of labor.